This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Origin of the Species by Natural Selection Or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin Chapter 11 On the Geological Succession of Organic Beings Part 2 On the Affinities of Extinct Species to Each Other and to Living Forms Let us now look to the mutual affinities of extinct and living species. All fall into a few grand classes and this fact is at once explained on the principle of descent. The more ancient any form is, the more, as a general rule, it differs from living forms. But, as Buckland long ago remarked, extinct species can be classed either in still existing groups or between them. That the extinct forms of life help to fill up the intervals between existing genera families and orders is certainly true but as this statement has often been ignored or even denied it may be well to make some remarks on the subject and to give some instances if we confine our attention either to the living or to the extinct species of the same class the series is far less perfect than if we combine both into one general system in the writings of Professor Owen, we continually meet with the expression of generalized forms as applied to extinct animals. And in the writings of Agassiz, of prophetic or synthetic types, and these terms imply that such forms are, in fact, intermediate or connecting links. Another distinguished paleontologist, Monsieur Gaudry, has shown in the most striking manner that many of the fossil animals discovered by him in Attica serve to break down the intervals between existing genera. Cuvier ranked the ruminants and pachyderms as two of the most distinct orders of mammals. But so many fossil links have been disentombed that Owen has had to alter the whole classification and has placed certain pachyderms in this same suborder with ruminants. For example, he dissolves by gradations the apparently wide interval between the pig and the camel. The ungulata of hoofed quadrupeds are now divided into the even-toed or odd-toed divisions. But the macrochenia of South America connects to a certain extent these two grand divisions. No one will deny that the Hyparion is intermediate between the existing horse and certain other ungulate forms. What a wonderful connecting link in the chain of mammals is the Typotherium from South America. As the name given to it by Professor Gerbet expresses, and which cannot be placed in any existing order. The Sireniaform, a very distinct group of the mammals and one of the most remarkable peculiarities in existing dugong and lamington, is the entire absence of hind limbs, without even a rudiment being left. But the extinct Halotherium had, according to Professor Flower, an ossified thigh bone Quote, articulated to a well-defined acetabulum in the pelvis, close quote. And it thus makes some approach to ordinary hooved quadrupeds, to which the sirenia are in other respects allied. The cetaceans, or whales, are widely different from all other mammals, but the tertiary swiglodon and squalodon, which have been placed by some naturalists in an order by themselves, are considered by Professor Huxley to be undoubtedly cetaceans and, quote, to constitute 
connecting links with the aquatic carnivora. Close quote. Even the wide interval between birds and reptiles has been shown by the naturalist just quoted to be partially bridged over in the most unexpected manner, on the one hand, by the ostrich and the extinct Archaeopteryx, and on the other hand, by the Compsognathus, one of the dinosaurians, that group which includes the most gigantic of all terrestrial reptiles. Turning to the invertebrata, Barand asserts, a higher authority could not be named, that he is every day taught that although Paleozoic animals can certainly be classed under existing groups, yet that at this ancient period the groups were not so distinctly separated from each other as they now are. Some writers have objected to any extinct species or group of species being considered as intermediate between any two living species or groups of species. If by this term it is meant that an extinct form is directly intermediate in all its characters between the two living forms or groups, the objection is probably valid. But in a natural classification, many fossil species certainly stand between living species and some extinct genera between living genera, even between genera belonging to distinct families. The most common case, especially with respect to very distinct groups, such as fish and reptiles, seems to be that, supposing them to be distinguished at the present day by a score of characters, the ancient members are separated by a somewhat lesser number of characters, so that the two groups formerly made a somewhat nearer approach to each other than they now do. It is a common belief that the more ancient a form is, by so much the more, it tends to connect by some of its characters, groups now widely separated from each other. This remark, no doubt, must be restricted to those groups which have undergone much change in the course of geological ages, and it would be difficult to prove the truth of the proposition, for every now and then, even a living animal as the Lepidosiren is discovered having affinities directed towards very distinct groups. Yet if we compare the older reptiles and baltrachians, the older fish, the older cephalopods, and the Eocene mammals with the recent members of the same classes, we must admit that there is truth in the remark. Let us see how far these facts and several inferences accord with the theory of descent with modification. As the subject is somewhat complex, I must request the reader to turn to the diagram in the fourth chapter. We may suppose that the numbered letters in italics represent genera, and the dotted lines diverging from them the species in each genus. The diagram is much too simple, too few genera, and too few species being given, but this is unimportant for us. The horizontal lines may represent successive geological formations, and all the forms beneath the uppermost line may be considered as extinct. The three existing genera, A14, Q14, P14, will form a small family, B14 and F14 a closely allied family or subfamily, and O14, I14, M14, a third family. These three families, together with the many extinct genera on the several lines of descent diverging from the parent form, A, will form an order, for all will have inherited something in common from their ancient progenitor. On the principle of the continued tendency to divergence of character, which was formerly illustrated by this diagram, the more recent any form is, the more it will generally differ from its ancient progenitor. Hence, we can understand the rule that the most ancient fossils differ most from existing forms. We must not, however, assume that divergence of character is a necessary contingency. 
it depends solely on the descendants from a species being thus enabled to seize on many and different places in the economy of nature. Therefore, it is quite possible, as we have seen in the case of some Silurian forms, that a species might go on being slightly modified in relation to its slightly altered conditions of life, and yet retain throughout a vast period the same general characteristics. This is represented in the diagram by the letter capital F, 14. All the many forms, extinct and recent, descended from A, make, as before remarked, one order, and this order, from the continued effects of extinction and divergence of character, has become divided into several subfamilies and families, some of which are supposed to have perished at different periods, and some to have endured to the present day. By looking at the diagram, we can see that if many of the extinct forms supposed to be embedded in these successive formations were discovered at several points low down in the series, the three existing families on the uppermost line would be rendered less distinct from each other. If, for instance, the genera A1, A5, A10, F8, M3, M6, M9 were disinterred, these three families would be so closely linked together that they probably would have to be united into one great family in nearly the same manner as has occurred with ruminants and certain pachyderms. Yet he who objected to consider as intermediate the extinct genera, which thus linked together the living genera of three families, would be partly justified, for they are intermediate not directly, but only by a long and circuitous course through many widely different forms. If many extinct forms were to be discovered above one of the middle horizontal lines or geological formations, for instance, above number seven, but none from beneath this line, then only two of the families, those on the left hand, A14, etc., and B14, etc., would have to be united into one, and there would remain two families which would be less distinct from each other than they were before the discovery of the fossils. So again, if the three families formed of eight genera, A14 to M14, on the uppermost line, be supposed to differ from each other by half a dozen important characters, then the families which existed at the period marked seven would certainly have differed from each other by a less number of characters, for they would, at this early stage of descent, have diverged in a less degree from their common progenitor. Thus it becomes that ancient and extinct genera are often in a greater or less degree intermediate in character between their modified descendants or between their collateral relations. Under nature, the process will be far more complicated than is represented in the diagram, for the groups will have been more numerous. They will have endured for extremely unequal lengths of time, and will have been modified in various degrees. As we possess only the last volume of the geological record, and that in a very broken condition, we have no right to expect, except in rare cases, to fill up the wide intervals in the natural system and thus to unite distinct families or orders. All that we have a right to expect is that those groups which have, within known geological periods, undergone much modification, should in the older formations make some slight approach to each other, so that the older members should differ less from each other in some of their characters than do the existing members of the same groups, and this by the concurrent evidence of our best paleontologists is frequently the case. Thus, on the theory of descent with modification, the main facts with respect to the mutual affinities of the extinct forms of life to each other and to living forms are explained in a satisfactory manner, and they are wholly inexplicable on any other view. 
On this same theory, it is evident that the fauna during any one great period in the Earth's history will be intermediate in general character between that which preceded and that which succeeded it. Thus, the species which lived at the sixth great stage of descent in the diagram are the modified offspring of those which lived at the fifth stage, and are the parents of those which became still more modified at the seventh stage. Hence, they could hardly fail to be nearly intermediate in character between the forms of life above and below. We must, however, allow for the entire extinction of some preceding forms, and in any one region for the immigration of new forms from other regions, and for a large amount of modification during the long and blank intervals between the successive formations. Subject to these allowances, the fauna of each geological period undoubtedly is intermediate in character between the preceding and succeeding faunas. I need give only one instance, namely, the manner in which the fossils of the Devonian system, when this system was first discovered, were at once recognized by paleontologists as intermediate in character between those of the overlying Carboniferous and underlying Silurian systems. But each fauna is not necessarily exactly intermediate, as unequal intervals of time have elapsed between consecutive formations. It is no real objection to the truth of the statement that the fauna of each period as a whole is nearly intermediate in character between the preceding and succeeding faunas, that certain genera offer exceptions to the rule. For instance, the species of mastodons and elephants, when arranged by Dr. Falconer in two series, in the first place according to their mutual affinities, and in the second place according to their periods of existence, do not accord in arrangement. The species extreme in character are not the oldest or the most recent, nor are those which are intermediate in character, intermediate in age. But supposing for an instant, in this and other such cases, that the record of the first appearance and disappearance of the species was complete, which is far from the case, we have no reason to believe that forms successively produced necessarily endure for corresponding lengths of time. A very ancient form may occasionally have lasted much longer than a form elsewhere subsequently produced, especially in the case of terrestrial productions inhabiting separated districts. To compare small things with great, if the principal living and extinct races of the domestic pigeon were arranged in serial affinity, this arrangement would not closely accord with the order in time of their production, and even less with the order of their disappearance, for the parent rock pigeon still lives, and many varieties between the rock pigeon and the carrier have become extinct, and carriers, which are extreme in the important character of length of beak, originated earlier than short-beaked tumblers, which are at the opposite end of the series in this respect. Closely connected with the statement that the organic remains from an intermediate formation are in some degree intermediate in character, is the fact, insisted on by all paleontologists, that fossils from two consecutive formations are far more closely related to each other than are the fossils from two remote formations. Pictet gives, as a well-known instance, the general resemblance of the organic remains from the several stages of the chalk formation, though the species are distinct in each stage. This fact alone, from its generality, seems to have shaken Professor Pictet in his belief in the immutability of species. He who is acquainted with the distribution of existing species over the globe will not attempt to account for the close resemblance of distinct species in closely consecutive formations by the physical conditions of the ancient areas having remained nearly the same. Let it be remembered that the forms of life, at least 
those inhabiting the sea, have changed almost simultaneously throughout the world, and therefore under the most different climates and conditions. Consider the prodigious vicissitudes of climate during the Pleistocene period, which includes the whole glacial epoch, and note how little the specific forms of the inhabitants of the sea have been affected. On the theory of descent, the full meaning of the fossil remains from closely consecutive formations being closely related, though ranked as distinct species, is obvious. As the accumulation of each formation has often been interrupted and as long blank intervals have intervened between successive formations, we ought not to expect to find, as I attempted to show in the last chapter, in any one or in any two formations, all the intermediate varieties between the species which appeared at the commencement and close of these periods. But we ought to find, after intervals, very long as measured by years, but only moderately long as measured geologically, closely allied forms, or, as they have been called by some authors, representative species, and these assuredly we do find. We find, in short, such evidence of the slow and scarcely sensible mutations of specific forms as we have the right to expect. On the state of development of ancient compared with living forms. We have seen in the fourth chapter that the degree of differentiation and specialization of the parts in organic beings, when arrived at maturity, is the best standard, as yet suggested, of their degree of perfection or highness. We have also seen that as the specialization of parts is an advantage to each being, so natural selection will tend to render the organization of each being more specialized and perfect, and in this sense, higher. Not but that it may leave many creatures with simple and unimproved structures fitted for simple conditions of life, and in some cases will even degrade or simplify the organization, yet leaving such degraded beings better fitted for their new walks of life. In another and more general manner, new species become superior to their predecessors, for they have to beat in the struggle of life all the older forms with which they come into close competition. We may therefore conclude that if under a nearly similar climate the Eocene inhabitants of the world could be put into competition with the existing inhabitants, the former would be beaten and exterminated by the latter, as would the secondary by the Eocene, and the Paleozoic by the secondary forms, so that by this fundamental test of victory in the battle for life, as well as by the standard of the specialization of organs, modern forms ought, on the theory of natural selection, to stand higher than ancient forms. Is this the case? A large majority of paleontologists would answer in the affirmative, and it seems that this answer must be admitted as true, though difficult of proof. It is no valid objection to this conclusion that certain brachiopods have been but slightly modified from an extremely remote geological epoch, and that certain land and fresh water shells have remained nearly the same from the time when, as far as is known, they first appeared. It is not an insuperable difficulty that foraminifera have not, as insisted on by Dr. Carpenter, progressed in organization since even the Laurentian epoch, for some organisms would have to remain fitted for simple conditions of life, and what could be better fitted for this end than these lowly organized protozoa? Such objections as the above would be fatal to my view if it included advance in organization as a necessary contingent. They would likewise be fatal if the above foraminifera, for instance, could be proved to have first come into existence during the Laurentian epoch, or 
the above brachiopods during the Cambrian formation, for in this case there would not have been time sufficient for the development of these organisms up to the standard which they had then reached. When advanced up to any given point, there is no necessity, on the theory of natural selection, for their further continued process, though they will, during each successive age, have to be slightly modified so as to hold their places in relation to slight changes in their conditions. The foregoing objections hinge on the question whether we really know how old the world is and at what period the various forms of life first appeared, and this may be well disputed. The problem whether organization on the whole has advanced is in many ways excessively intricate. The geological record, at all times imperfect, does not extend far back enough to show with unmistakable clearness that within the known history of the world, organization has largely advanced. Even at the present day, looking to members of the same class, naturalists are not unanimous which forms ought to be ranked as highest. Thus, some look at the Salisians or sharks from their approach in some important points of structure to reptiles as the highest fish. Others look at the Teleosteans as the highest. The Ganoids stand intermediate between the Celesians and the Teleosteans. The latter at the present day are largely preponderant in number, but formerly Celesians and Ganoids alone existed, and in this case, according to the standard of highness chosen, so will it be said that fishes have advanced or retrograded in organization. To attempt to compare members of distinct types in the scale of highness seems hopeless. Who will decide whether a cuttlefish be higher than a bee? That insect, which the great von Baer believed to be, quote, in fact, more highly organized than a fish, although upon another type, close quote. In the complex struggle for life, it is quite credible that crustaceans, not very high in their own class, might beat cephalopods, the highest mollusks, and such crustaceans, though not highly developed, would stand very high in the scale of invertebrate animals, if judged by the most decisive of all trials, the law of battle. Beside these inherent difficulties in deciding which forms are the most advanced in organization, we ought not solely to compare the highest members of a class at any two periods, though undoubtedly this is one and perhaps the most important element in striking a balance. But we ought to compare all the members high and low at two periods. At an ancient epoch, the highest and lowest molluscoidal animals, namely cephalopods and brachiopods, swarmed in numbers, and at the present time both groups are heavily reduced while others, intermediate in organization, have largely increased. Consequently, some naturalists maintain that mollusks were formerly more highly developed than at present, but a stronger case can be made out on the opposite side, by considering the vast reduction of brachiopods and the fact that our existing cephalopods, though few in number, are more highly organized than their ancient representatives. We ought also to compare the relative proportional numbers at any two periods of the high and low classes throughout the world. If, for instance, at the present day 50,000 kinds of vertebrate animals exist, and if we knew that at some former time only 10,000 kinds existed, we ought to look at this increase in number in the highest class, which implies a great displacement of lower forms as a decided advance in the organization of the world. We thus see how hopelessly difficult it is to compare with perfect fairness under such extreme complex relations the standard of organization of the imperfectly known faunas of successive periods. We shall appreciate this difficulty more clearly by looking to certain existing faunas and floras. 
from the extraordinary manner in which European productions have recently spread over New Zealand, and have seized on places which must have been previously occupied by the indigenes, we must believe that if all the animals and plants of Great Britain were set free in New Zealand, a multitude of British forms would in the course of time become thoroughly naturalized there and would exterminate many of the natives. On the other hand, from the fact that hardly a single inhabitant of the southern hemisphere has become wild in any part of Europe, we may well doubt whether, if all the productions of New Zealand were set free in Great Britain, any considerable number would be enabled to seize on places now occupied by our native plants and animals. Under this point of view, the productions of Great Britain stand much higher in the scale than those of New Zealand, yet the most skillful naturalist, from an examination of the species of the two countries, could not have foreseen this result. Agassiz and several other highly competent judges insist that ancient animals resemble, to a certain extent, the embryos of recent animals belonging to the same classes, and that the geological succession of extinct forms is nearly parallel with the embryological development of existing forms. This view accords well with our theory. In a future chapter, I shall attempt to show that the adult differs from its embryo owing to variations having supervened at a not early age, and having been inherited at a corresponding age. This process, whilst it leaves the embryo almost unaltered, continually adds, in the course of successive generations, more and more difference to the adult. Thus the embryo comes to be left as a sort of picture preserved by nature of the former and less modified condition of the species. This view may be true, and yet may never be capable of proof. Seeing, for instance, that the oldest known mammals, reptiles, and fishes strictly belong to their proper classes, though some of these old forms are in a slight degree less distinct from each other than are the typical members of the same groups at the present day, it would be vain to look for animals having the common embryological character of the vertebrata, until beds rich in fossils are discovered far beneath the lowest Cambrian strata, a discovery of which the chance is small. On the succession of the same types within the same areas during the later tertiary periods. Mr. Cliff, many years ago, showed that the fossil mammals from the Australian caves were closely allied to the living marsupials of that continent. In South America, a similar relationship is manifest even to an uneducated eye in the gigantic pieces of armor, like those of the armadillo, found in several parts of La Plata. And Professor Owen has shown in the most striking manner that most of the fossil mammals buried there in such numbers are related to South American types. This relationship is even more clearly seen in the wonderful collection of fossil bones made by Messrs. Lund and Clausen in the caves of Brazil. I was so much impressed with these facts that in 1839 and 1845 I strongly insisted on this, quote, law of the succession of types, on this wonderful relationship in the same continent between the dead and the living, close quote. Professor Owen has subsequently extended the same generalization to the mammals of the old world. We see the same law in this author's restorations of the extinct and gigantic birds of New Zealand. We see it also in the birds of the caves of Brazil. Mr. Woodward has shown that the same law holds good with seashells, but from the wide distribution of most mollusks, it is not well displayed by them. 
Other cases could be added, as the relation between the extinct and living land shells of Madeira, and between the extinct and living brackish water shells of the Aralo-Caspian Sea. Now, what does this remarkable law of succession of the same types within the same areas mean? He would be a bold man who, after comparing the present climate of Australia and of parts of South America, and under the same latitude, would attempt to account, on the one hand, through dissimilar physical conditions, for the dissimilarity of the inhabitants of these two continents, and, on the other hand, through similarity of conditions, for the uniformity of the same types in each continent during the latter tertiary periods. Nor can it be pretended that it is an immutable law that marsupials should have been chiefly or solely produced in Australia, or that edentata and other American types should have been solely produced in South America. For we know that Europe in ancient times was peopled by numerous marsupials, and I have shown in the publications above alluded to that in America the law of distribution of terrestrial mammals was formerly different from what it now is. North America formerly partook strongly of the present character of the southern half of the continent, and the southern half was formerly more closely allied than it is at present to the northern half. In a similar manner, we know from Falconer and Cotley's discoveries that northern India was more formally closely related in its mammals to Africa than it is at the present time. Analogous facts could be given in relation to the distribution of marine animals. On the theory of descent with modification, the great law of the long-enduring but not immutable succession of the same types within the same areas is at once explained. For the inhabitants of each quarter of the world will obviously tend to leave in that quarter during the next succeeding period of time, closely allied, though in some degree modified, descendants. If the inhabitants of one continent formerly differed greatly from those of another continent, so will their modified descendants still differ in nearly the same manner and degree. But after very long intervals of time and after great geographical changes, permitting much intermigration, the feebler will yield to the more dominant forms, and there will be nothing immutable in the distribution of organic beings. It may be asked in ridicule whether I suppose that the Megatherium and other allied huge monsters which formerly lived in South America have left behind them the sloth, armadillo, and anteater as their degenerate descendants. This cannot for an instant be admitted. These huge animals have become wholly extinct and have left no progeny. But in the caves of Brazil, there are many extinct species which are closely allied in size and in all other characters to the species still living in South America. And some of these fossils may have been the actual progenitors of the living species. It must not be forgotten that, on our theory, all the species of the same genus are the descendants of some one species, so that if six genera, each having eight species, be found in one geological formation, and in a succeeding formation there be six or other allied or representative genera, each with the same number of species, then we may conclude that generally only one species of each of the older genera has left modified descendants, which constitute the new genera containing the several species, the other seven species of each old genus having died out and left no progeny. Or, and this will be a far commoner case, two or three species and two or three alone of the six older genera will be the parents of the new genera. The other species and the other old genera having become utterly extinct. 
In failing orders, with the genera and species decreasing in number, as in the case of the Edentata of South America, still fewer genera and species will leave modified blood descendants. Summary of the preceding and present chapters. I have attempted to show that the geological record is extremely imperfect, that only a small portion of the globe has been geologically explored with care, that only certain classes of organic beings having been largely preserved in a fossil state, that the number both of specimens and of species preserved in our museums is absolutely as nothing compared with the number of generations which must have passed away even during a single formation. That, owing to the subsidence being almost necessary for the accumulation of deposits rich in fossil species of many kinds and thick enough to outlast future degradation, great intervals of time must have elapsed between most of our successive formations that there has probably been more extinction during the periods of subsidence and more variation during the periods of elevation, and during the latter the record will have been least perfectly kept, that each single formation has not been continuously deposited, that the duration of each formation is probably short compared with the average duration of specific forms, that migration has played an important part in the first appearance of new forms in any one area and formation. That widely ranging species are those which have varied most frequently and have oftenest given rise to new species. That varieties have at first been local. And lastly, although each species must have passed through numerous transitional stages, it is probable that the periods during which each underwent modification, though many and long as measured by years, have been short in comparison with the periods during which each remained in an unchanged condition. These causes, taken conjointly, will to a large extent explain why Though we do find many links, we do not find interminable varieties connecting together all extinct and existing forms by the finest graduated steps. It should also be constantly borne in mind that any linking variety between two forms which might be found would be ranked, unless the whole chain could be perfectly restored as a new and distinct species for it is not pretended that we have any sure criterion by which species and varieties can be discriminated. He who rejects this view of the imperfection of the geological record will rightly reject the whole theory, for he may ask in vain where are the numberless transitional links which must formerly have connected the closely allied or representative species found in the successive stages of the same great formation. He may disbelieve in the immense intervals of time which must have elapsed between our consecutive formations. He may overlook how important a part migration has played when the formations of any one great region, as those of Europe, are considered. He may urge the apparent, but often falsely apparent, sudden coming in of whole groups of species. He may ask, where are the remains of those infinitely numerous organisms which must have existed long before the Cambrian system was deposited? We now know that at least one animal did then exist, but I can answer this last question only by supposing that where our oceans now extend, they have extended for an enormous period, and where our oscillating continents now stand, they have stood since the commencement of the Cambrian system, but that long before that epoch, the world presented a widely different aspect in that the older continents, formed of formations older than any known to us, 
exist now only as remnants in a metamorphosed condition, or lie still buried under the ocean. Passing from these difficulties, the other great leading facts in paleontology agree admirably with the theory of descent, with modification, through variation and natural selection. We can thus understand how it is that new species come in slowly and successively, how species of different classes do not necessarily change together, or at the same rate, or in the same degree. Yet in the long run, that all undergo modification to some extent. The extinction of old forms is the almost inevitable consequence of the production of new forms. We can understand why, when a species has once disappeared, it never reappears. Groups of species increase in numbers slowly and endure for unequal periods of time, for the process of modification is necessarily slow and depends on many complex contingencies. The dominant species belonging to large and dominant groups tend to leave many modified descendants, which form new subgroups and groups. As these are formed, the species of the less vigorous groups, from their inferiority inherited from a common progenitor, tend to become extinct together and to leave no modified offspring on the face of the earth. But the utter extinction of a whole group of species has sometimes been a slow process, from the survival of a few descendants lingering in protected and isolated situations. When a group has once wholly disappeared, it does not reappear, for the link of generation has been broken. We can understand how it is that dominant forms which spread widely and yield the greatest number of varieties tend to people the world with allied but modified descendants, and these will generally succeed in displacing the groups which are their inferiors in the struggle for existence. Hence, after long intervals of time, their productions of the world appear to have changed simultaneously. We can understand how it is that all the forms of life, ancient and recent, make together a few grand classes. We can understand from the continued tendency to divergence of character why the more ancient a form is, the more it generally differs from those now living. Why ancient and extinct forms often tend to fill up gaps between existing forms, sometimes blending two groups previously classed as distinct into one, but more commonly bringing them only a little closer together. The more ancient a form is, the more often it stands in some degree intermediate between groups now distinct. For the more ancient a form is, the more nearly it will be related to and consequently resemble the common progenitor of groups since become widely divergent. Extinct forms are seldom directly intermediate between existing forms, but are intermediate only by a long and circuitous course through other extinct and different forms. We can clearly see why the organic remains of closely consecutive formations are closely allied, for they are closely linked together by generation. We can clearly see why the remains of an intermediate formation are intermediate in character. The inhabitants of the world at each successive period in its history have beaten their predecessors in the race for life, and are, in so far, higher in the scale, and their structure has generally become more specialized. And this may account for the common belief held by so many paleontologists that organization on the whole has progressed. Extinct and ancient animals resemble, to a certain extent, the embryos of the more recent animals belonging to the same classes, and this wonderful fact receives a simple explanation according to our views. The succession of the same types of structure within the same areas during the later geological periods 
ceases to be mysterious, and is intelligible on the principle of inheritance. If, then, the geological record be as imperfect as many believe, and it may at least be asserted that the record cannot be proved to be much more perfect, the main objections to the theory of natural selection are greatly diminished, or disappear. On the other hand, all the chief laws of paleontology plainly proclaim, as it seems to me, that species have been produced by ordinary generation, old forms having been supplanted by new and improved forms of life, the products of variation, and the survival of the fittest. End of chapter 11, part 2 Read by Dennis Sayers, Modesto, California, Winter 2006